So uh, yeah, our speaker today is uh, Mike Kipp. He uh, got a bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Notre Dame, and then went on to be a graduate research and as a graduate research fellow uh, at the University of Washington. He got his PhD there in 2019 in earth and space sciences and astrobiology. From there, he moved to his current appointment um, at Caltech, where he is an uh, Agron Institute Geobiology Postdoctoral Fellow. And um, let's see, Mike's work um, really kind of focuses on reconstructing uh, the coevolution of, of life and the environment um, over multiple time scales, looking at Earth's, Earth's history. And he uses a variety of geochemical uh, techniques and modeling to do that. Uh, he's interested in and has studied the redox history of the ocean and atmosphere system uh, kind of through earlier Earth's history, uh, pre-Cambrian. Um, but interestingly, he's taken that kind of a lot of people are focusing on, uh, you know, how how oxygen levels changed in early Earth history. Uh, his focus has been on that, but then also on how that's coupled to uh, kind of the evolution of major nutrient cycles, carbon cycle, um, nitrogen cycle in particular, and also phosphorus um, over kind of a range of time scales. It's focused on earlier Earth history. Um, and more recently, his work at Caltech is focusing on uh, glacial interglacial cycles using uranium isotope proxies for redox conditions in the ocean um, to try to better understand, uh, again, coupling of oxygen and uh, biogeochemical cycling through those events. Uh, throughout all, he's um, been uh, involved in a variety of kind of outreach efforts, including work um, during his time at UW with the Robinson Center for Young Scholars, and then more recently, uh, Caltech Center for Teaching, Learning, and Outreach. In both cases, trying to develop curricular materials that um, expose a, a broad range of students and local communities to earth science concepts uh, kind of earlier than they would otherwise. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michael and just say that we're happy to have you here and excited to hear your talk. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you, Gabe, for the the intro um, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in as well. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to get to chat with some folks in the department today. Um, so I'm going to try to share with you a sort of a cross section of some of the projects I, I work on and specifically talk about my approach to this field I like to call paleo biogeochemistry or earth system evolution. And here on my title slide, I'm sort of um, depicting my, my way of envisioning sort of the workflow of a paleobiogeochemist. And what I just want to highlight here is that we, uh, like many in the geosciences, at different points in time, we kind of wear different hats. So sometimes we're geologists and we're going out and we're collecting samples. And sometimes we're doing chemistry in the lab, we're purifying elements that we care about. Uh, we make these careful analyses and we work hard to put our data in a a rigorous statistical framework. And if you go to talks by us, you know, Earth System Evolution folks, we often focus on these quantitative interpretations or maybe on some method developments with the chemistry or analysis. Um, but today what I'd like to do is, is focus a bit more on this first step in the process. And specifically, I'd like to demonstrate that regardless of whether you're making careful measurements or doing a rigorous quantitative uh, treatment of your data, if you pick the wrong sample archive, then from the outset, you could undermine your ability to draw precise or even accurate conclusions about Earth's evolution. So the way I'm gonna do that is first uh, open the talk by motivating this work a bit more, discussing what my, my research interests are, and, and then use an analogy that I hope will illustrate the, the take home message of today's talk. And then I'll move into two vignettes about work that I've done in, in very different contexts, so some recent and some ongoing. Um, the first being in looking at terrestrial environments and the cycling of nitrogen, the essential nutrient in plant systems. And then the second one, looking at trace element cycling in the ocean and how it can inform our understanding of oxygen levels uh, in the past. And so let's dive right in. So I, I really think there's no better description of my broad research uh, interest than the cover artwork of Wally Broker's famous book here, which is How to Build a Habitable Planet. As you can see here, we're thinking about the, the chemical building blocks that go into not just making a habitable planet, but more so sustaining 
habitable conditions on geological time scales, so billions of years, and what are the chemical interactions that allow that to, to take place. So more specifically, this means that I'm interested in questions like how life has co-evolved with its environment through time, or even more specifically, looking at how environmental or maybe geophysical or planetary events have impacted the biosphere and vice versa. So how have biological events like say the, the rise of certain metabolic pathways totally restructured the chemistry of Earth's surface environment. And like I said, this sort of comes just from an innate curiosity. I'm, I'm just really interested in knowing these things. It puts us in a planetary context to understand this evolution of our habitable planet, uh, but it also feeds kind of more practically into some some other uh, tangentially related topics. So on the one hand, uh, this plays into the search for life beyond Earth, both in our own solar system and, and beyond as we start to measure the, the compositions of atmospheres on distant planets. And knowing the evolution of Earth through time and the different faces of our habitable or inhabited Earth is really our only way to be prepared to interpret these sorts of data. So I am very much interested in using this work to, to feed into that effort and more sort of urgently and on recent time scales, looking at how we can better quantify global change in the past as a means to understand sort of the, the range of possibilities for, for forthcoming climate change. So these are sort of the things that guide me where I'm going, but they all funnel me to the same place, which is having to look at old earth materials that record the conditions in the environment or in life uh, in the past. And so this is what brings me to the, the metaphor that I'd like to sort of use to illustrate today's take home point, which is one that I use actually when I speak to, to middle school and elementary school audiences as well. It's about finding the right storytellers. And so if you'll allow me, let's imagine for a moment we're thinking not about earth history, but uh, maybe human history on, on say, you know, 2000 year time scales of maybe continental Europe. And we know that there are some regime changes, state changes, things that we want to reconstruct in this case in, in human populations. And since these human populations don't exist, we can't access them. We need some archive of that information. And on these time scales, it's largely written archives. And so you need some tool or some proxy to access the information in those archives. And this would be in this case, a language. And so you could use any number of languages. Let's say you use Latin to access maybe earlier parts of this range, you could use the English language, so on. You have many choices. The point I want to make here is that if you were doing this and you started looking at different archives and you were getting conflicting reports or you're finding missing information or things that just appear biased, you wouldn't blame the language for having a flawed internal logic. You'd rather say that the, the archive was perhaps mistaken. Maybe we know that it was an archive that's easily degraded or we know it's known to be biased even at the time of incorporating the information. This, actually, this seems kind of secondhand in, in this example, but the point I wanna to make today is that the same is true when we're thinking about Earth's history, and now we're thinking about billion year time scales. So we're interested again in these state changes, the evolution of life from a microbially dominant planet to that of eukaryotes or even animals and, and plants as we see today. And in this case, the archives in which that that change is recorded are sedimentary materials or fossils, these old vestiges of, of materials on Earth's surface. And the language we can use to, to read those changes in this case is chemical. So we have at our disposal the whole periodic table and not just elemental concentrations, but as geoscientists, we've actually gotten very creative using the natural variability and stable isotopes of these many elements to track reaction pathways and the provenance of different materials. So the point I'd like to make today is that when we do this and we get conflicting results about what's going on in the past, I think we should not blame the, the chemical logic of the proxy that is sort of necessarily true at some fundamental level, but, but rather we should maybe examine whether our archives are telling us what we actually want them to and see if we could maybe find a more pristine or precise window into reconstructing some aspect of Earth's environmental evolution. So that's what I hope to, to illustrate today, but I'd like to be able to show rather than tell that to you. And so I'll, I'll do this with these sort of two case studies. The first, like I said, being about nitrogen cycling in ancient terrestrial settings. And so we'll be looking at a proxy system that behaves a bit like this, uh, eventually make our way to samples that look like that. And hopefully at the end, be able to say something about ecosystems that looked like that. Okay, but why would we start with nitrogen of all of these choices, all the elements in the periodic table? Um, 
couple of reasons. First off, nitrogen is an essential building block of all um, life. So it's in fact the next most abundant atom after carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We need it in our nucleobases, amino acids. So all life needs nitrogen, but there's a catch, which is that most nitrogen at Earth's surface is present as N2 in the atmosphere. And this N2 can only be fixed or accessed, harnessed into biological form by a subset of prokaryotes, so bacteria and archaea, a subset of them that is capable of doing this. And basically the rest of the biosphere then depends on this supply of nitrogen. And not in all environments is that supply uh, coming in all that rapidly. So this is all just to say that access to nitrogen or the flow of nitrogen into ecosystems can, can regulate total ecosystem productivity. We know this is true in the ocean. We know it's true on land. And so that's one reason to care about it as an essential nutrient. Uh, but there's another aspect of its chemistry that we need to focus on today, which is that nitrogen is also redox sensitive, meaning the, the dissolved species of nitrogen that will dominate in aqueous environments is a function of redox conditions, or in the sake of the ocean, we could think of uh, ocean waters that have a lot of dissolved oxygen. In that case, nitrate would be the, the dominant ion, whereas anoxic or reducing conditions would have ammonium be favored. And this means that we can use nitrogen to track uh, these redox conditions or say oxygen availability, not just across the modern environment, but perhaps uh, throughout Earth's evolution. So we have reason to care about nitrogen. And like I said, we don't just use nitrogen abundance, but we actually leverage variability in the different stable isotopes of nitrogen to track this. So the way we're going to refer to this throughout the talk will be in this delta notation. So our delta 15N here is referring to the 15 to 14 N ratio of a given sample relative to some standard, the standard in this case being air, the atmospheric N2 that is globally homogeneous. And then we subtract by one and multiply by a thousand. So that means that these are relative differences in the parts per thousand we'll be discussing. And I'll take a minute here to just discuss how we think this proxy behaves and what it can actually tell us about nitrogen cycling or redox conditions in the environment. So I'll start by doing so in the case of the ocean, but we'll see in a minute, it's not all that different on land. We have nitrogen starting in the atmosphere. It exists in abundance as N2, and this can dissolve into the ocean. And this N2 then is accessible to those organisms that can do nitrogen fixation, like I mentioned, these bacteria and archaea. In the ocean, this is dominantly cyanobacteria amongst the dominant primary producers. They can fix N2 into their biomass. And over here, I'll be tallying the isotopic effects of these different reactions. We see that nitrogen fixation by these cyanobacteria tends to have a very small effect. So this is zero to two parts per thousand. So it typically looks, this nitrogen has a very similar 15 to 14 N ratio as the N2 from the atmosphere. But it can meet uh, one of two fates after these organisms die, that nitrogen, it can either settle with biomass to sediment, but this is actually the vast minority of nitrogen and the rest will be recycled or remineralized, so released from that biomass. And this can happen in sediment pore waters, where actually it can be captured by, by clay minerals, or it can happen in the water column. And note that, again, this recycling process or remineralization tends to have rather small isotopic consequences, less than a couple parts per thousand. And in theory, then, if this ammonium were to build up to any appreciable level. It can also be assimilated then. It's in bioavailable form. It can be taken up by organisms that aren't capable of fixing their own nitrogen. And again, in most circumstances, unless you've accumulated an enormous reservoir, that uptake process will not have a large isotopic fractionation. And so what's worth noting here is that all these pathways I've shown so far in black are not strictly speaking oxygen dependent. So that's to say they could occur in an ocean where there is entirely no oxygen. And note that they all, in typical environmental conditions, tend to have small isotopic effects. But the situation changes when oxygen is present, as it is in the modern ocean, because nitrate instead of ammonium is the dominant form of dissolved nitrogen. And because it's thermodynamically favorable to exist as nitrate, there are organisms that can make a living by reacting ammonium with O2 in the process of nitrification. But this is actually very rapid in modern environments and it's thought to be a quantitative transfer of that nitrogen, meaning that there's no, again, no expressed isotopic fractionation. And this nitrate then that accumulates can also in turn be taken up by other organisms, say eukaryotic phytoplankton that can't fix their own nitrogen. 
But there's one more important pathway here that we need to discuss, which is that in environments where there's low oxygen levels, so oxygen drops below the threshold where aerobic respiration is favorable, nitrate can actually be respired um, instead of oxygen during denitrification. And the nitrate can be reduced to N2, which is gaseous and can escape into the atmosphere. And what's important about this is that this process of denitrification when it's occurring in the water column like this is thought to have a preference for 14N ending up as N2 and then escaping into the atmosphere. So what this means is that the nitrate that's left in the ocean is enriched in 15N. It's heavier than the atmosphere. And on average, this is about a, an effect in the modern ocean of about five parts per thousand, the offset between this nitrate and the N2. So that offset is at some level sensitive to the balance of these processes. It can tell us something about this, these redox conditions, the presence of oxygen. But it's not just present in the dissolved nitrate because this nitrate is being taken up by these organisms, some of whose biomass is sinking and being preserved in sediments. And so what paleoceanographers do, or paleobiogeochemists, is go out to old sediments or sedimentary rocks, and they measure the delta 15N value of the whole sediment as a proxy for what's going on here. And it's worth noting at this point that that bulk sediment value then is comprised of whatever is in that organic material, which could come from the nitrogen fixing organisms or from those that assimilated nitrate as well as any nitrogen that was accumulated in clay minerals. So it's a hodgepodge of things, but at first order, we think it's telling us something about what's going on in the ocean. And that's what people have spent a lot of time doing over the past decades, is using this framework and looking at ancient marine sediments or marine sedimentary rocks. And so what I'm gonna show here is a compilation of a lot of that data across most of Earth's history. So we're looking here at three and a half billion years of Earth history, and these are marginal marine siliciclastic sedimentary rocks. So largely shales, uh, fairly rich in organic matter. And what you see is that we're comparing this to the history of atmospheric oxygen levels reconstructed in this review paper from some years ago based on variety of proxy evidence, but strictly speaking, not the nitrogen data. And we see that there's a first order agreement where the rise of nitrogen isotope ratios in these bulk sedimentary rocks to these positive values that perhaps indicate some amount of this aerobic and anaerobic or oxic to suboxic nitrogen cycling occurs in tandem with the beginning and the prelude to the great oxidation event, the initial rise of oxygen in Earth's surface environment. We see that these values are sustained. They maybe drop to intermediate values and they perhaps rise to near modern values in the, the second rise of oxygen. So maybe at a first order level, this does work, but if we try to quantify this more explicitly, we start to see just how imprecise it actually is. And so what I'm showing here is an output from a box model we made where we took the fluxes we saw on the previous slide, all those different pathways. We took their known isotopic fractionations, so the known effects, and we said, okay, let's think now about as a function of a meaningful variable. So the fraction of the surface ocean that is conducive to that denitrification or that is suboxic, so below a certain dissolved O2 threshold. We know what that value is today and we know what the dissolve or the delta 15N of sediments is today on average. And you can then get a model that tells you globally averaged at least how those are related. But let's say that we went out in practice, we actually measured a two billion year old shale at plus five for delta 15N. And then we wanted to do the inversion and go from the delta 15N to this parameter, we see that the data then would be consistent with potentially less than modern suboxia or an order of magnitude greater. And this is not even the full scope of the uncertainty because this is a global average in this plot. And we know that there's variability in the modern ocean around the global average. So this is all to say that maybe we're getting some first order information about from this record, but these insights into past nitrogen cycling from these bulk marine sediments are imprecise a lot of this has to do with that mixing of different components that you cannot deconvolve after the fact. Okay, so that's true in the ocean, but what about in terrestrial environments? So the equivalent place to look would be soils. So these are the sediments collecting the falling detritus and organic matter from biological activity on land. And people have measured delta 15N in soils worldwide. This is a figure just from a, an older paper now and it's a small scale here, but from the colder to warmer colors, we're looking at more than 10 per mil, 10 parts per thousand variability. 
So we know there's variability in this value and it actually correlates with some climatological parameters like mean annual temperature, precipitation, things that are some way related to that, that loss of fractionated nitrogen largely through that denitrification flux amongst other pathways. But again, for sake of argument, let's say we go out and we wanted to measure a paleosol in old soil. And again, we get a value of plus five per mil and we wanted to say something about past environmental conditions. We see that this is a very non-unique system. So those data are consistent with a wide range of values. So my point of all of this is that we're maybe able to get some first order information out of these archives, but maybe there's also a more precise archive out there that'll give us cleaner insights into nitrogen cycling and allow us to answer targeted. And this is what brings me to thinking about foliage, because if you go out in the modern environment, we've known for a long time and people have spent quite a bit of time going out to different plants. You can take as many leaf samples as you want. You can go at the leaf to plant to species scale all the way up to ecosystem scale, study nitrogen cycling in high precision. And in theory, we could do something to that effect in fossil deposits. So it's admittedly much rarer to find uh, carbonaceous compression fossils um, compared to modern foliage, but over centuries now, people have amassed collections of these. They're stored in museums, curated. We know a fair bit about the context. In theory, we can do the same sort of analysis. But what might we hope to learn by doing so? So what I'm showing here is a, a modified version of that marine nitrogen cycle figure, but now we're considering uh, terrestrial environments. You'll note these are the same fluxes with their same isotopic consequences. We have this gaseous loss of due to denitrification being amongst the dominant fractionating pathways. And as we saw on the previous slide, there's isotopic variability in soil nitrogen worldwide. And that's reflected then in foliage as well which we're seeing here in this histogram, which is a histogram of delta 15N values in more than 11,000 leaves measured worldwide. This is from a, a large database. You'll see there's more than 40 parts per thousand variability, although most of the data are within maybe several per mil, several parts per thousand of the atmospheric value. So there's a lot of noise perhaps there. There's a lot of variability, but what's interesting is that there are plants that are an exception to this rule. And those are plants that have forged symbioses with nitrogen fixing bacteria. And these bacteria often live in modified root structures. And what they do is fix nitrogen from atmospheric N2 into bioavailable form that they supply directly to the plants. And by doing so, these plants are short circuiting this complicated isotopic fractionation and processing going on in soils. And as a result, we've known for a long time that their foliage much more closely resembles the Delta 15N value of the atmosphere. So very close to zero. And this has been known actually, again, since the 80s, people were speculating that we could use this sort of technique to quantify nitrogen fixation in agricultural settings, say looking at legumes. But what I wanna ask here is whether we can apply this way of thinking to tracking symbiotic nitrogen fixation in deep time, looking at fossil plants and see if we can make the same distinction. And what this brings me to is our case study here which is trying to reconstruct the evolution of nitrogen fixing symbiosis in cycads, which I'm showing here. Um, if you haven't thought about these, they're a really interesting group of plants. So this one is colloquially known as the sago palm and cycads are often mistaken for palms or sometimes ferns, but they're actually neither. They're an ancient group of gymnosperms. And what's maybe most striking about them is that every extant species of cycad host symbiotic nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria in these modified roots known as coralloid roots that, oops, that I'm showing here. And you can see in this cross section, uh, here's this dark band of the active zone of cyanobacterial nitrogen fixation. So the fact that all of these cycads that we see today have these nitrogen fixing symbionts would seem to suggest that this is an ancestral trait to the cycads. That's the most parsimonious explanation for that distribution in the clade. But it gets a little more complicated because the cycads actually have a very long um, evolutionary history. They're known from as uh, long ago as the Paleozoic, so more than 250 million years ago. And despite that long history, recent phylogenetic work has suggested that the all extant cycad species or most um, species that we see today actually originated or diversified as recently as the Miocene, so in the last 20 million years. And what this suggests then is that these long branches perhaps reflect a prevalence of extinction and shaping the 
the history of cycads through time. And this is in fact consistent with what we know from the fossil record, which is that they were abundant during the Mesozoic and many of these taxa went extinct. So this raises an interesting conundrum. On the one hand, the fact that all cycads today have nitrogen fixing symbionts seems to suggest that this is ancestral. But on the other hand, it seems that something very recently has shaped the history of cycads. And so maybe this is a, a recently developed um, uh, strategy of them and it reflects environmental or ecological changes in more recent time. So we wanted to test this with our nitrogen isotope proxy. And the first step in doing so was making sure that this actually works in the modern system just the way that we think it should. And so what you're seeing here is the distribution of cycads that are extant. And what we did is we collected samples from some field sites. So we um, got samples from a, a variety of places in Australia, as well as combined some these with some data from uh, published studies. And we wanted to compare the foliage of cycads to that of other plants growing in their midst, like this eucalyptus tree in the background, to see if they indeed have resolvable delta-15N signatures. And what we found was encouraging. So in every site from which we have modern cycad delta-15N data, the cycads have delta-15N values that are close to this atmospheric value of zero within a couple parts per thousand. So as we'd expect, and other plants growing in their midst are much more isotopically variable, or in some sites, actually isotopically variable and offset from the atmospheric value. And so this is telling us these plants are pulling nitrogen from the soil pools, whereas cycads are likely getting it from their symbionts. So this is great because what it means is, like we'd hoped, we can use delta-15N and cycads and comparing them to other plants in the same habitat to see if we find evidence for or absence of nitrogen fixation. And then the task was just to go out to look at all of these fossil cycads we could get our hands on and reconstruct this history through time. That's where things got a little more complicated because it's one thing to measure nitrogen isotopes in modern foliage, but in fossil foliage, it's, it's a whole other ball game. Um, it's hard to find uh, specimens that have enough preserved material, let alone with curators who are willing to let you destroy it irreversibly um, for analysis. And so over many years of method development and uh, wrestling with curators at different museums and, and really just a lot of help from some great paleobotanists, um, plus a, a little field work of our own, we, we finally amassed a large sample set to, to test this um, question. And so I'm showing some examples of what these specimens look like here. We really tried to focus on the best preserved samples we could find where you can isolate the organic material from its background matrix. And uh, here's just an example of me saying my last words to a 200 million year old cycad leaf before stuffing it into tin cups to be returned to N2 and CO2 molecules. Um, so I'll just dive right into the data because we, we found some really interesting stuff. To begin with, so just up the road really from University of Washington in the Eocene Chuckanut formations, this is about 50 million years ago that it was deposited, we found that the foliage of cycads was very uh, close to that of the range of living cycads and close to the atmospheric value of zero per mil. Whereas when we looked at other plants in the same habitat, we saw that they were isotopically enriched on average by more than two parts per thousand relative to the atmosphere. And uh, it's also worth noting that the carbon to nitrogen ratio in these different, um, different groups was not statistically distinguishable, which is one piece of evidence that maybe hints that this is not an, an artifact of differential preservation, um, but they've likely not undergone very different degradational histories. And so the most parsimonious explanation of this data is that like today, the cycads were receiving nitrogen from their nitrogen fixing symbionts, whereas other plants were not, which alone is extremely exciting because you know, we didn't necessarily know this would work so well and it is the oldest terrestrial evidence directly representing nitrogen fixation in a, in a, or a nitrogen fixing symbiosis uh, in terrestrial environments. So that was really cool, but it, it got even more interesting because we started to look at old cycads from the Mesozoic. And what we found was that in all of the Mesozoic sites from which we could compare cycad foliage here in the blue and non-cycad foliage, in all cases, they were statistically indistinguishable. And not just were they matching each other, but they were also all isotopically elevated relative to the values seen in modern cycad foliage. So this suggests most parsimoniously 
that both cycads and the other plants in the midst were pulling nitrogen from these isotopically fractionated soil pools. And what it then suggests is that the symbiosis arose sometime, sometime later, maybe towards the end of the Mesozoic, early Cenozoic. So this led us to consider what could have possibly been driving this, this shift in ecological strategy. And we can't quite answer that question, but it's interesting to think about these possibilities. And so what I'm going to do is cast these data now in a phylogenetic context. And this is kind of a lot going on here, but to, to walk through it here on the top, what we're seeing are all not just extant cycad species, but also, uh, sorry, genera, but also extinct cycad genera, known only from the fossil record. So the extant uh, genera go to time zero here, but the way they're all related here phylogenetically is through a morphological trait matrix. And uh, several of these have been published lately. We're using the most recent, and it's worth noting that our conclusions at this point uh, don't change if we were to shift between any of the recently published trees. So what we're showing plotted on top of this tree is the presence or absence of Delta 15N evidence for nitrogen fixation. So in the white symbols, we see active evidence of nitrogen fixation, which occurs in all extant species, as well as 50 million years ago in the genus Dion from the Chuckanup formation. But in all these other samples that we had analyzed, we do not see active evidence of nitrogen fixation. And what this tells us is sort of two things. On the one hand, it suggests that the the symbiosis is not ancestral as would have been the default assumption based on this universal distribution we see today. But more interestingly, because we know the genus Cycas diverged quite early from the rest of the cycads, it suggests that this symbiosis was developed at least more than once, which is clearly not the most parsimonious explanation, and perhaps points to a strong environmental or ecological driver of which there are a few possible explanations. So I'll just, uh, consider a few of those here. One is that we know through the end of the Mesozoic, so here across the Cretaceous I'm showing, that angiosperms came to displace gymnosperms in terrestrial flora. And so this compilation is from an older paper looking at percent, percent species per fossil flora. You see angiosperms coming to dominate at the expense of gymnosperms like the cycads. So perhaps this forced cycads into um, conditions where they could only compete when they had this competitive advantage of nitrogen fixing symbionts. But on the other hand, we also know there was environmental change throughout the Cenozoic. So there's pronounced cooling through the Cenozoic and eventually in the Miocene in aridification and uh, enhanced seasonality that is known to have triggered diversification in other um, arid, semi-arid um, tolerant species like succulents and in fact lines up with the inferred phylogenetic reconstruction of recent cycad diversification. And so maybe that played a role in serving as a bottleneck towards all cycads today, thriving based on this symbiosis. And these are things we could potentially test with future analyses of the few um, existing late Cenozoic cycad fossil deposits. Okay, so that's all I have for this first part of the, the talk, but I wanna recap by saying, I think that nitrogen isotopes are a useful proxy, but we need to view these data in the context of whatever archive we analyze. And so if that archive is a marine sediment or a soil, then I think we can get first order redox or nutrient cycling information out of it, but it's going to be necessarily imprecise, largely due to this multi-component mixing of different organic matter sources. In contrast, I think that if we look at discrete foliage, we get much more precise information. This is true in the modern environment, but we showed with this pilot study that in the case of cycads, we can actually track nitrogen fixation through their evolution, which was really neat. And so I think there are a lot of future applications of this. On the one hand, like I said, we can continue to piece together the pattern of nitrogen fixation in fossil cycads, but we could do the same in theory in other lineages. So for instance, in the legumes where not all legumes today are nodulating or have nitrogen fixing um, active symbiosis. And we could also potentially leverage this in studies of uh, trophic structure in deep time because another use of nitrogen isotopes for a long time has been based on the recognition that delta 15N values get progressively higher. 15N is enriched as you move up the food chain. This has been the basis of using animal collagen delta 15N to reconstruct the trophic position of ancient animals, but it necessarily rests on some assumptions about the composition of the base of the food chain. And we know that this can be variable in the modern 
environment. And so I think it could only help these to start to add um, more data to these sorts of reconstructions with the, the capability of measuring delta 15N on small amounts of fossilized foliage. Okay, so that's all I have to say about nitrogen, but now I wanna talk about something almost completely different, which is uranium isotopes and the oxygen content of the ocean. And so we'll end up looking at data sets like this, make our way eventually to samples like that, hopefully be able to, to say something about ocean conditions such as the one presented here. Okay, so why would we care about uranium? And there are a lot of reasons one could think about uranium. Uh, for instance, its role in geochronology or in nuclear studies, but I'm gonna focus on very different aspects of uranium cycling the reasons that make it of interest to paleoceanographers or paleobiogeochemists. And the first of these is that uranium has a long residence time in the ocean, meaning each uranium atom on average spends about 400,000 years in seawater. And in contrast, the ocean mixes on, a, on about 1,000 year time scales. So this means that each uranium atom experiences many mixing cycles and uranium is thus well mixed. So there's a homogeneous uranium concentration throughout the ocean correlates with salinity. And this means that if you take a sample at one point in the ocean, it can tell you about the amount of uranium in seawater anywhere, which is really nice because if you're a paleoceanographer and there's some archive that records the ambient uranium content of seawater, then all of a sudden you can use that archive to make global inferences in the past, which is sort of the holy grail of paleoceanography. But it's not just that it has a long residence time. It is also the fact that like nitrogen, Uranium has a redox sensitive behavior. So it's soluble in its six plus valence state in surface environments. But when uranium becomes reduced to four plus, which is insoluble, it can be removed into sediments. Um, we know this happens in anoxic sediments throughout the modern ocean. And this is an efficient sink of uranium from the ocean. So what that means is that the total amount of uranium removal from the ocean scales to some extent with the amount of the seafloor that is anoxic. So if more of the seafloor is anoxic, you'll remove it more efficiently. This will be reflected in the amount of uranium that's in the ocean. And so you can, in theory, use some archive of past uranium to deduce the amount of anoxia that is in the seafloor. But again, it's not just uranium concentrations we use to get at this, we use uranium isotopes. And in this case, we're not talking about the radioactive decay of uranium isotopes, but we're going to look at their mass dependent behavior. So we're going to normalize them in a way where we don't need to worry about the decay through time. And we're gonna, again, use a delta notation here. We'll be thinking about the isotopes 238 and 235 with respect to the standard, which in this case is less environmentally meaningful. Okay, so how do we think this proxy works? Um, there's been quite a bit of work done in the last decade and a half to piece together the uranium isotope mass balance of the surface environment. And this is sort of summarizing what we think we know about this. So we've measured the composition of uranium in continental materials and in rivers that are draining the continents, bringing uranium into seawater. We've measured the composition of uranium in seawater and then measured it in its removal in different sinks. So including this anoxic sediment sink that I mentioned which typically has an isotopic preference for 238 relative to 235 of about 0.6 parts per thousand. And then into many other sinks here that in some are thought to have a negligible net isotopic fractionation, but we'll come back to that. This includes um, suboxic or oxic sediments and carbonates. So what's, what paleoceanographers like to do is uh, start by making it even simpler so we remove some of the things that we don't understand as well. And then you cast everything in a, an isotope mass balance expression as it's done here. So we're tracking the flux in and then out in these two sinks, the amount of uranium in seawater, this N term, and then the isotopic fractionation associated with each pathway. And what you can do then with this sort of framework is make a plot like the following one, where you can cast the Delta 238 value of seawater as a function of the fraction of the seafloor that is anoxic. And we can get this term from this flux term by using a rate constant, where we assume or it's actually constrained by observations, mass flux in the modern uh, ocean, looking at anoxic sediments. 
And this allows us then to equate the delta 238 value to a measure that we care a lot about as paleoceanographers, as paleobiologists, and so on. And so we can calibrate this in the modern ocean. We can say we know the modern delta 238 value. We know the extent of anoxia. It's about 0.2% of the seafloor, so very little. A lot of that actually is just from the Black Sea. And then we can say if we have an archive of this value in the past, let's say we measured that value at minus 0.6, we'd slide on over here and at steady state at least, it would be consistent with about 1% of the seafloor being anoxic, about five times more than today. So this has become the basis of a very popular proxy and people do exactly this using carbonates as that proxy for the seawater composition. Because like I said in here, the assumption that's based on some data is that carbonates are recording without fractionation the seawater value when they precipitate from seawater. There's uranium that gets incorporated into them with no isotopic fractionation. So you can go to old carbonates of which there are many in the geologic record. You can do this inversion and you get this parameter. And you can look at that through extinction events, uh, ocean anoxic events, the rise of animals, you name it. And people have done just that. In fact, have gone sort of crazy doing it. This is a screenshot of not even just, so this is the last three years, I think not every single paper that has used that framework. And actually at this rate, we're going to be reading a new paper uh, almost every week if, if we keep it up uh, using this exact framework. So uh, this is my way of saying we should maybe ask a question of how quantitatively robust these reconstructions are. And so what I'm going to revisit here is the extent to which these carbonates actually record that seawater value. Like I said before, it's known that when carbonates precipitate from seawater, they don't do so with an isotopic fractionation. But if you go look at recent carbonate sediments, so this is the modern analog of what we're measuring in the geologic record when we look at old carbonate sediments. And these are data from drill cores through Bahamas sediments. And you measure the delta 238 values on the x-axis here, and you see that compared to the seawater value, which is this vertical gray band, they are typically very much isotopically fractionated and it's variable, but on average about 0.2 per mil heavier than seawater. And not just that, but they actually tend to have more uranium in them than you would expect from carbonates precipitating directly from seawater, which is this horizontal band. And so what it suggests is that uranium is being incorporated in late stage burial and it's isotopically fractionated, this uranium that's added. So this is a problem because our assumption then is invalid. Um, these are not a direct proxy for seawater. And this is from a, a recent paper, but there has been some hint of this for a while. And so authors in the literature have taken sort of one of two approaches. Either they make the assumption that there's no isotopic fractionation in their archive, and then they do that F anoxic, that seafloor anoxia calculation accordingly, or sometimes a uniform offset is assumed usually about 0.3 per mil. And all the data are uniformly corrected and then the value is calculated. And what I'm showing here is just a test of what these different correction schemes imply for your history of seafloor anoxia using a published data set. So this is from some recent work I've done here in my postdoc where we, we've developed a, a inverse modeling framework to treat these Delta 238 data sets and try to most robustly recover this seafloor anoxia value. And fitting the data sets aside, we found that clearly one of the largest, if not the largest hurdle to doing so accurately is the choice of this correction. Because for this particular data set, so this is actually from carbonates that span the, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, you see a large drop in delta-238, which is consistent with an expansion of ocean anoxia. But if you assume no correction versus a uniform correction, versus this variable one, which I've here just sampled this actual distribution randomly from modern carbonate data, you get very different implications for seafloor anoxia. And in some cases, you entirely misidentify or miss uh, anoxic intervals. And the problem is that after the fact, we have no way of knowing which of these correction schemes is most accurate. And so this is just a necessary limit on the precision and accuracy of these Delta 238 based reconstructions of seafloor anoxia, if you're going to be using these bulk carbonate sediments, because we know they're prone to this sort of diagenetic alteration. So of course, then in theme with the talk, 
my, my hunch is that there must be better archives out there that are not subject to this sort of post-burial alteration. And this is what's led me in my work here at Caltech to start studying deep sea corals. And what I'm showing you here is an individual of the species Desmophilum dianthus. This is a, a modern individual from Tasmanian seamounts. And these have been studied by oceanographers, paleoceanographers for quite a long time. Here's a schematic of the same thing we're looking at. What you can do is sample individual septa as shown here. So pull out, we know a lot about the, the life history of these. You, they have these growth bands. You can subsample a septum, sample multiple septa. You can get a lot of precise information. And maybe what's most important for our sake here is that these are deposited or I think it's precipitated and exist above the sediment water interface. So these are not sitting in that messy pore water system like the carbonate sediments from the Bahamas were. And so this led us to suspect that these will probably be much more pristine archives of seawater delta 238 values. And what I've done so far is gone to a bunch of these modern specimens and actually revisited a lot of seawater samples. And these have come from geotraces cruises, which actually had not been yet measured for delta 238. And what we've found using the latest high precision uh, methods for Delta 238 analysis is that there's an astonishing agreement between seawater and these deep sea corals. Uh, in fact, the, the seawater being a very slightly different value than had been published before, but again, matching different coral individuals and different septa on the same coral. So we think this is a really robust signature and again, contrast this with the Bahamas sediment data, which is largely fractionated. So this records the modern value, but what sort of questions could we ask with this archive? Because we know these corals haven't existed for billions of years. And if we do look at the, the age distribution of corals from the two sites from which we have these samples, so this is coming from the work of Jess Adkins and others here at Caltech over the last many years, from these two different archives in the Tasmanian Seamounts and some from the North Atlantic, we can reach back in the North Atlantic case, we know over 200,000 years. And these are just the samples that have already been um, U-series dated. So there are many others that haven't. Now, again, this is not going to tell us about the end Permian mass extinction, but across this interval, there have been meaningful climatic changes in the form of glacial interglacial cycles that I'm showing here with the ice core CO2 record. And these are not just climatic fluctuations, but it's actually for a while been hypothesized that there are uh, concomitant changes in the oxygen content of the ocean, perhaps even as a direct stoichiometric consequence of carbon storage in the deep ocean during ice ages. And it's been a, a task of paleoceanographers for quite a while to try to quantify that missing oxygen that is thought to equate to the amount of stored carbon. And we're wondering maybe if we can leverage this archive to give us high precision insights into at least that seafloor anoxia parameter on glacial and interglacial timescales. And so I'm sorry to say, I can't give you the answer to that one today. Those samples are some of them sitting in beakers, uh, the floor below me waiting to, to go on the mass spec. But what we've done in the meantime is just quantify using our new inverse modeling framework, the, the plausibility of recovering these sorts of very subtle trends using those, the known age distribution of our existing sample set, our known achievable analytical precision, and then plugging that into the model for a range of scenarios. So basically no trend to some uh, slight or moderate shift in Delta 238 through time. And what we find is that we can indeed recover these fluctuations that are quite small in seafloor anoxia through time. And what's maybe most useful is that for any given time slice, let's say the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, what we can get then is a probability distribution of the likely extent of seafloor anoxia. And we can compare that to the modern. So this is not just giving us some quantification, but actually quantifying the uncertainty on our reconstruction of this parameter. And so I guess all I can say on that front is stay tuned. I hope that these data will, will come out um, smoothly in the, in the spring and summer as we continue to work on this. So to wrap up that second part of the talk, I again think that uranium isotopes are a powerful proxy for oxygen levels in the ocean through time but we again need to be careful both in how we quantify our interpretations and how we select samples for these studies. So I didn't have uh, enough time to go into great depth about this new modeling approach, but I think by, by using this, we can not just get the full quantitative power 
of this proxy, but we can also quantify the remaining uncertainty, which is about as good as we can do, I guess, in these, these sorts of studies. And what's better though, is if we can find archives that also circumvent the, the very largest source of uncertainty, which is that diagenetic offset, this offset that arises during late burial. And in the case of the deep sea corals, this is very promising so far. And I think it will tell us something meaningful about Pleistocene redox fluctuations, which of course do not only tell us about uh, glacial interglacial cycles, but they might also hold implications for the possible extent of ocean deoxygenation as we continue to add CO2 to the atmosphere. At this point, well in excess of the change in CO2 from the last glacial maximum to the Holocene. And I think there are also uh, future directions to, to build on this. So on the modeling front, right now we're just incorporating the uranium isotope data, but we could also include other proxy data sets, say carbon isotopes, and then fitting multiple data sets, we could start to actually get at mechanisms driving some of these events, which I think would be really neat. And we can also start to target other biological archives of Delta 238, and some that actually reach back longer into the past. And we've had some luck starting to do that here in Caltech as well. So to wrap all of this up, I, I hope that in these two case studies, I've shown that in these pale environmental studies, your in inferences are just going to be as precise as the, the proxy or the archive um, allows them to be. And understandably, early work with a lot of these isotopic tracers was focusing on ubiquitous lithologies, so shales, carbonate sediments, things from which we can get a lot of material, easily accessible, easy to measure. But these are necessarily imprecise because there's these mixing pots of material. And I think the way forward in large part is going to focus on targeted archives with the more clear provenance and perhaps even less complicated um, alteration history. So my, my parting words then are just that if you're in the business of trying to reconstruct past environmental conditions and using any of these proxies, and it's not quite uh, giving you sensical information, don't blame the, the chemical logic of the proxy, but perhaps consider whether there's an archive that actually tells the story you want to be told. So with that, I'll, I'll finally wrap up. I have a lot of folks to thank uh, from Washington, from Caltech and beyond other collaborators, um, a lot of uh, groups that have funded this work over the years. And just thanks to all of you again for tuning in. I'm really happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm.